And uh, welcome to the Healing at CWS Radio at blogtalkradio.com. I am your host, Dustin Astacio, and that was the Adams Road Band. Uh, actually, uh, two of them are sons of our guests today, uh, Mike and Lynn Wilder, and um, that's their Book of Life CD. They have a new CD out called The Great Commission. Just go to adamsrollband.com, and you can get a download or you can um, uh, order the CDs. Uh, they're, they're free of charge, and um, and they have dedicated themselves completely to the ministry of song, and uh, they've decided that they're going to give away their, their music free, and, and I have to say their Book of Life CD is, is, uh, is really great, and this is a favorite of Mom. So um, I wanted to play this particularly. Uh, Mike and Lynn Wilder are our guests. Hello, Mike and Lynn, are you there? We are, Gus. Thank you for playing that song. That's huge for me, before and after <laughs> Christ. <laughs> you guys got to be too. so... Yes, yes, I hear you, Mike. Great, great. Yes, this is, thank you. Uh, you guys got to be so proud of your sons um, uh, and what they're doing in ministry. And, um, and I, I mean... Uh, I'll tell you, 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 your chest got to be way out there with the pride that you have in, in your children and what they're doing in the Lord. And um, and you have a, a fantastic story that we're going to hear um, one half of, and uh, we're going to hear the other half from your kids, um, uh, your two sons, uh, next month, and some of the other band members are going to share their stories. And we're excited to have you guys on. Um so uh, Mike Wilder was a high priest in the Mormon Church, and uh, for those of you who are listening, Lynn Wilder was a professor at BYU, and so we're going to be uh, uh, hearing some of their stories, some of their testimony. Uh, for those of you uh, who have uh, who have seen the adver- advertisement, I've placed some links and. Um, and you can uh, hear Mike on another podcast sharing his story, and uh, and also Lynn on I think on a YouTube channel um, uh, sharing her story. But I, I've given several links, and so I want to welcome you both to the show. Thank you, Gus. It's always an honor, and boast in the boys. No, we boast in the cross. <laughs> it is definitely Amen. God's. Story. It is is God's thing, and it's been such a miracle what He's done in our lives. And thank yeah. you for caring about Mormons and um, their, you know, their trek to the cross. We hope to see many of them come to Jesus. Amen, amen. You know, um, the reason why I've, I've been doing this, and, and we have a, a fun-filled next three months of covering, you know, other groups outside of the Jehovah's Witnesses is is that I do know that a lot of ex-witnesses, a lot of ex-witnesses jump from cult to cult. They do a lot of cult jumping. Um, And I just want to ask our listeners to please pray for David Lawrence, he's someone I encountered, and, uh, you know, uh, he decided that he wanted to go to Russell's original teachings, and so uh, uh, pray for him. Pray for Ray Halpern, who's someone I encountered also, a Jehovah's Witness who, who, uh, who, who was studying to become a Jehovah's Witness, stopped studying, and then became interested in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so this is the reason why we're doing these programs, why we're having former Mormons, we're having former members of the Worldwide Church of God and Armstrongism, former Adventists this summer. And uh, because we know that um, uh, a lot of times we, we, we leave the cults, but we don't find Christ. And um, and and we we are grasping for this ident- identity with truth in an organization in a religion, and it's just it, we feel that this relationship with Jesus Christ is just too ambiguous, and so I, I think that a lot, I'm sure a lot of Mormons become Jehovah's Witnesses, a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses become Mormons, and um, and, uh, and 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 I and the cross is, is, is an appropriate song to begin with because I know. That Mormons, uh, like Jehovah's Witnesses, are not too fond of the cross, are they? Mormons don't use crosses in any of their Sunday chapel buildings, and 
on the top of their Mormon temples, they have the angel Moroni, who supposedly brought the Book of Mormon to Joseph Smith. So, yeah. no, there is no reverence for the cross. They, This is what Mormons say. If your mom died by a gun, would you wear a gun around your neck? <laughs> well, that's <laughs> to what them, the children the... say, too. <laughs> Yeah, to them, basically, the uh, the cross is an instrument of death. Wow! Now, Mike, you, you're you're the major culprit who brought who who, uh, who was probably the first one to, to to jump into the LDS Church. Am I not correct? Uh, yes, I I I dragged my wife uh, kicking and screaming. Uh, but the <laughs> you know what is is, is interesting. Um, you know, when when you come into the LDS Church, you know, when you meet those missionaries, they just seem so nice and pleasant, and they just seem so good and sweet, which they are. They are. I right. love I love the Mormon people. I love the missionaries. Anytime I see the missionaries riding their bikes or anything, I'll either talk with them or I'll wave to them or I'm kind to them. Do not throw apples at them or oranges. Be love them and. And the you know because that is the true nature of Christ is to love people. But we do have a a, a commission given to us by Jude to contend for the faith. And and uh, when when you know I end up joining the LDS Church, and again I always tell people I knew enough about the Bible to be dangerous. And so when the Mormon missionaries talked about key points, prophets, oh yeah, I've heard of prophets. Apostles, oh yes, I understand apostles. Jesus Christ, yes, I, I know Jesus Christ. He died for our sins, oh yes. Just the basic things that they taught, they they kind of drew me in. And uh, my wife and I always did things together. And uh, so um, she said if if I'm going to join the LDS Church, then she would join also, and, and away we went. But once we got indoctrinated, uh, we were serious people for 30 years until God brought us out. Wow. Now, now, um, were you, you, you both raised in a Christian upbringing? Yeah. Strangely enough, I was raised Presbyterian and Methodist in a family that went to church every week but never opened the Bible outside of church and I'm not even sure we had one to take to church. Um Mike was brought up Baptist. Yes, it was a it was a, one of those Baptist cults. No, <laughs> just a joke. <laughs> no, I was actually raised Southern Baptist and again I was taught basic principles by my parents uh but kind of never got into the core doctrine of, of of the Bible. And one of the studies that we read years later they said there are more converts that come from the Baptist Church to Mormonism than any other group. Uh, so it's it's interesting. I think the Baptists are looking for things, uh, and if they don't find it in that in, in their own congregation, they they kind of jump out looking for other things. But the uh, the uh, uh, you know it, it just was my mistake. I I never really defended my family. You know, my wife at that point by not understanding the scriptures and not being able to sit down with the missionaries and say, well, everything you taught me is is great, you know, from a Mormon standpoint, but it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ, and there's a huge difference. There is a Mormon Jesus, and then there's a biblical Jesus, and there are two separate beings. And once you really begin to understand the doctrine of Mormonism and compare it to Christianity, it just jumps out at you. That it's not now, Christian. Now, now, being raised in, in, in the Presbyterian and the Baptist churches, you guys, um, I guess you, you you got married at what age? Twenty-two. Twenty-two. Okay, so yeah. now um, uh, you had a Christian wedding, I'm sure, right? Yes, in the Presbyterian oh. Church. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. Um, so, um, wow, this is this is um, pretty pretty phenomenal. Uh, you both were raised in a Christian home. You were. Uh, uh, apparently had uh, at least a, a grasp of uh, Christian doctrine enough to get married in the church. Uh, I'm sure you, you spoke to a, your pastor and he confirmed that you both were Christians and whatnot. Um, 
and, and, I'm, I, and, and that, that's interesting that um, the statistics show that a lot of Baptists are joining the Mormon Church because actually the first church that I got baptized in um, leaving the drills was, was Southern Baptist Church, and I currently attend one. Um, haven't been in several churches, but um, Southern Baptists are definitely usually really, really strong on on biblical teaching, on, on you know teaching the Bible generally. So that, that's uh, that's interesting. It's specifically Southern Baptists. Yeah, and and you know what's interesting? Um, uh, God does an amazing work. When we um, came out of Mormonism, we were kind of stumbling around, and we found very close to where we live a little uh, uh, Southern Baptist church that we attended for multiple years. And the pastor there, I love him dearly, and uh, we visit a lot of different churches as we try to help people come out of Mormonism. We kind of get planted here and there. We'll find somebody who's coming out of Mormonism, go into a certain church, and we'll attend that there to help them. Uh, so as kind of God leads us, we, we jump around between the churches. But, but he put us in this uh, little Baptist church for two years to be taught the Word of God. And what was interesting, that particular pastor that year said, um, we started going there in like January, uh, he said, we're going to go from the Bible from the beginning to the end in one year. And every Sunday, it was a sermon about the Bible, you know, starting in Genesis, ending up in Revelation. And then the next year, he said, you know, we covered so much information, we're going to do it again, but now we're just going to do the New Testament. And that was a key foundation for us to really start seeing I mean, we knew when we came out of Mormonism, we there was problems, there was major contradictions, but we in never doctrine. had in, in doctrine of Mormonism and the Bible, and this teaching just uh, solidified those things that we were learning and gave us a, a foundation, a true Christian foundation, so that you know we could be built upon the rock and not upon the sand and not upon right. false doctrine. Well, I, so, I mean, no doubt, uh, eventually you guys came back out of Mormonism. So, um, you know, whatever you learned it, it was there, and whatever they taught fell on rocky soil. <laughs> right, right. You know, what, what's interesting, what's interesting in Mormonism, like when we j- join, many of the core beliefs uh, in Mormonism, uh, the missionaries do not talk about. In fact, I don't think they understand. And only after we were in leadership position and members for many, many years, did uh-huh. we really begin to understand the core beliefs of Mormonism. Uh, well, so I mean, when when you initially join, it's very, very, very basic, okay? Uh, but then as you get indoctrinated, you're, you're, uh, the, the weight of the Bible becomes less and less and less. The Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants become more and more and more, and the teachings of the Latter-day Apostles, and Latter-day Prophets uh, overshadow the Bible. Uh, they supersede that, and and you don't get that at first because mm-hmm. I told the Mormon missionaries, I said, now is the Bible more important than the Book of Mormon, or is the Book of Mormon more important than the Bible? I said, absolutely not. That is not correct. I mean, they they are equal weight to both the Word of God, and, and you know, so those are things that we were looking for. But uh, once we got into the LDS Church, we realized. The Bible is the least importance of their standard works. Well, of course, only as it is translated correctly, of course. But That's right. That's the uh, eighth <laughs> article of faith. Right, right. right. We, we, we believe in the oh. Bible. In fact, uh, let me just read that since you, you mentioned this. Mike, Please, I think um, I can quote it. Okay, Actually, go ahead. Yeah, we we okay. believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also right. believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. The the truth behind that, once you've been in the church for a while, is that the Book of Mormon is the most correct book on the face of the earth, and the Bible is right. corrupt. Right, right. They have they have errors, of course, except for the um, Joseph Smith copy of the KJV. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, which that, Joseph that, Smith that totally translated he, correctly, right? Joseph Smith totally rewrote the Bible, uh, 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 which the LDS Church doesn't use. But it's interesting that they do have the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. So, now, yeah, I, I want our listeners to really pay attention to this because 
what you will find very, very common in the cults is that they usually have their own unique translation of the Bible or the, some type of corrupted version of the Bible. And, and this seems to be a very, very common practice amongst cults, that they have to distort the word of God in order to, to uh, I guess, corrupt your thinking so that you can you know, think the way they think that you're reading the Bible through their lenses. But, um, yeah, so this, this is, this is uh, one means, I think, that, um, that the Mormon church um, really works, I can see. Um, now, um, uh, Mike, um, what was it specifically that drew you um, into the church? Uh, was it the charitableness of the Mormon missionaries? Because I know they're very, very charming, and uh, I've encountered Mormon missionaries. I mean, if, if you, I, 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 to be honest with you, I, I, I told Mormon missionaries that come to my door, if it was just for your kindness, um, I'd be a Mormon yesterday hmm. because um, in many respects, Mormons show a, a charity that many American Christians just don't have. That That is correct. Uh, there are so many good things about the, uh, the Mormon church, the LDS church, the members. That's why I, I do love them so. And the fact is, is that uh, what drew me um, was was a variety of things. Was that I was really impressed that these Mormon missionaries were going out on their own money and time to to serve the Lord for two years. Um, my wife and I um, had been thinking about, you know, these were kind of like latter days. Um, I had actually read in in the sixties, the late great planet Earth, and right. Len had just this. Uh, taking a correspondence study of the Old Testament and was beginning to feel like, you know, things are happening, that these are changing. And lo and behold, these two missionaries knock on a door from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Right. And so it, it kind of started teaching, you know, these are the end times. We have to prepare. So that was kind of kind of ringing the bell with me. Another thing that, that affected me was... Um, uh, they really bragged and talked about that they had no paid ministry, that the money you gave to the Mormon church went to the help to poor and needy. Um, right. Well, that's not exactly true. Uh, but the, uh, the, what happens is that at the local level, uh, like uh, in a local congregation, you have all the people that work there, the bishop, the uh, the counselors, the Relief Society president, all those people give their time gratis. And a bishop could may spend as much as 20, even sometimes up to 30 hours per week doing service work. Remember, sure. in Mormonism, our salvation is tied through works. It's a religion of works, okay? So you do all these nice things, you get all these bonus points, brownie points, that you will be saved because you are saved, and according to the Book of Mormon, you are saved after all you can do. So the mentality of Mormonism is that I've got to work, I've got to keep working, I've got to, I've got to endure to the end and do all I can to save myself, and then God will kick in the rest of the grace and I'll be saved. So that's the mentality you have. So... So it, it, the the concept that there was no paid ministry, all these people are, are working so hard for something that they believe in, wow, this, this must be neat. Until many, many years later did I realize that the top leaders of the L LDS Church are paid compensation. They are paid. Uh, you know, I thought they were always did it gratis, you know, that they made their money in the professional world, and they, you know, but uh, that's not exactly true, and I've had leaders tell me that. And that was, I just learned that a few years ago. I mean, like, just, uh, you know, uh, 10 years ago. So, um, so you're drawn to that. And, again, it's, it's, it's this family. You know, families are forever. Uh, well, you know, in Christianity, families are forever, too. But, but they never talk about that. They don't talk about the, 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 the unique family, the family of God, the family of Christ, sitting at right. the table eating together. You know, so so Mormonism is very good at taking key Christian points, building on it, making people feel really good about that, and then changing the concept just slightly to get you indoctrinated. Because 
once you're in Mormonism, again, you're taught, you know, all the other churches are not of God. They're an abomination. They're a national abomination, that the Mormonism is the only true and living church upon the face of the earth. With which the Lord Lord is is well well pleased. pleased. And this is in their their actual scriptures. So it's a long process, and again, uh, unless you know the word of God, know that it is a living and active and sharper, sharper than a two-edged sword from Hebrews, you know, once you understand that, when the missionaries come to you, then you can say, well, that's a nice concept, but it's not in the Bible. And, you know, we didn't well, have that knowledge. We didn't have enough knowledge to defend ourselves against false teachers. And that's so true, as you mentioned, because every cult has – They've got to change the Bible. They've got to interpret it different ways because they have to introduce their own doctrine to justify who they are. Amen. Now, I hope our listeners are hearing this. I hope that if you're a current witness or your next witness, I mean, this has to sound like an exact parallel of what we've experienced uh, from the idea of that we work and we labor. We, of course, we have we call it field service. Um, you guys did mission work and you did many other charitable work. Um, but it's all about work the, the hardest and then God fills in the rest. It's, That's right. It's it's a work uh, base. Yeah. Both of them are, are that uh, um, direction. And, again, yeah, but, they keep you so busy, you really don't have time to get into the Bible and study the Word. All right. Now, I, t- I will say this uh, uh, that's a little bit different about the Mormons is that they grasp you at the heart by emotional appeal as opposed to mm. Jehovah's Witnesses inundate you with a great deal of of knowledge. I mean, they, they wow you at the door because they they know where the books of the Bible are and they know certain scriptures and whatnot, and they are able to approve text the Bible. Um, and, but I, I remember the Mormon missionaries coming to my door asking me to pray uh, that the, the Book of Mormon was true. And... Um, and I said, well, I won't pray that the Book of Mormon is truth. What I will pray is for God to reveal the truth, whether the Book of Mormon is true. <laughs> as a, as a, there's a definite difference in the, in the two. Now, Lynn, um, your husband, okay, has now um, he he's uh, he's been enthralled by these Mormon missionaries and they're, they're the fact that this is the latter days. Um, your parents. Um, what was what was the idea of your parents? Now, your parents were they uh, just nominal church going Christians, or were they? Uh, what was their reaction to you guys now choosing to join the Mormon Church? Boy, that is a really good question. My parents were at the time, I would say, nominal Christians. After I left home, they became very strong Christians, got into a community church and learned the word and got into Bible study fellowship. But at the time, they were nominal Christians. So my dad came to our baptism in the Mormon church, so I figured he was okay with it. My Mm -hmm. mom and my sister refused to come, but they never had a conversation with me about why they didn't come. So there was always this underlying thing for 30 years with my Christian family that they weren't real pleased about our Mormonism, but no one ever spoke to us or tried to have a conversation with us about why Mormonism might not be Christian. And, you know, this is a real problem, I think, for Christians and Mormons, Christians and Jehovah Witnesses. Christians that don't have enough knowledge about those cults just kind of leave the people alone. Right. But there's this mission field all around you of people that are hurting and people that already think they love Jesus and want Jesus. They just have been deceived into going to the wrong Jesus. Um, So that's a mission field for us that's rife. You know, these are people that desire faith. They have that, they recognize that hole in their soul. And I was angry when I finally learned the truth and came out of Mormonism. I went through a real anger stage with my family. How 
could my family be Christian and nobody ever tell me or make an effort to have a conversation with me? We highly recommend to people that you invite those missionaries in and you show them the differences in doctrine, that somebody actually opened that door to truth for people who are so blind. And what was what was Mike's parents' reaction? Well, uh, my parents were uh, up in their years, and uh, um, I was the the I was what they call the accident of four children. I think my mom had me like at forty, forty one, and my dad was like forty two or so, and so mm-hmm. they you know. They taught us. I, I don't think they were real pleased, but they respected us as adults. And again, mm-hmm. they just kind of uh, you know loved us and and uh, accepted us and uh, loved our grandchildren, their their grandchildren, and so forth. And so, but but uh, no time did they ever sit down with us and just say. Um, well, there maybe there's one time uh, that Lynn's going to maybe bring up a point here. But uh, they they um, really never sat down with us with the Bible and says, you know, the Bible says these points. Now, do you believe this or do you believe something else? And and it's right. really quite simple. You know, people can do that. And and a little bit later on, I'd like to I, I want to come back to this point of about the, the deception of Mormonism, what they imply they believe and what they really believe. And this is actually found on their website. Uh, it's called Mormonism 101, Facts, ans- Answers, and Questions, put out by the right. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the newsroom. And I want to go through a couple points here where they just say absolutely they're lying on this website. It's a- Unless mm-hmm. I have this... I have been so dumb in Mormonism over all these years, I just didn't see it. So something, either either they're right and I'm wrong or vice versa. But uh, we'll talk more about that later. But, uh, again, it's a matter of gently teaching. You can't, you, can't, you can't do this to a Mormon. You can't say, you need to repent now or you're going to hell. That's not going to do it. So you have to gently bring them in and show them that their Jesus is different from the Bible Jesus, and and that's a key point. Once you understand that, then it, it comes very, very, very quickly. Uh, I think oh, I'm going to call it folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to tell the story that when Mike's parents got elderly, they lived with us for 10 years, and they went to a Baptist church while we went to our Mormon church. So one day his pastor came to visit, his parents' pastor came to visit them and told them that Mormons believed in having sex in heaven. So the only thing I ever remember his father asking us was, do you guys really believe you're going to have sex in heaven? Because Mormons do believe that marriage is for this life and for the next life and that a man's going to have a whole bunch of wives in the next life. And uh, we answered him by saying, sure, what's wrong with that? <laughs> and he didn't know what to say. <laughs> so, so, again, uh, you know, we we were we were thinking that, well, you know, Adam and Eve, you know, God made Adam and Eve, and they had babies, and that's an eternal principle. And, and anything that's done upon this earth that is good, ordained of God, is going to be ordained in, as a per, per concept or a procedure that's going to be done in the hereafter. That's a Mormon right. concept. And so we naturally believed, since we were sealed in the temple to be married for all time and eternity for this life and the hereafter, that once we got to heaven, we would also have spirit children, which now I think of as kind of silly because we're fully resurrected beings having spirit children. It doesn't doesn't make sense. That's a whole different concept. Right. <laughs> well, what, yeah, so what he's saying well, is do, when do, you re- do they believe in a bodily resurrection or something yes, similar to yes. what the Jehovah's Witnesses believe uh, uh, that the resurrection is actually just uh, a spiritual resurrection? No, Mormons believe that you'll have a body of flesh and bone and that you'll continue to be married and continue to have sex and that a man will need lots of women because he's going to have to people a world. Right. So he and his wife have and his wives 
have to have lots and lots of spirit children that then wait in this holding tank until they're born on an, on the earth. That's the way it works in Mormonism. You have a pre-existent life full of all these little spirits floating around, waiting to come to inhabit a body because that's how you progress eternally. So then you get to come to earth, have a body, have all your trials, die, then um, you're resurrected in the next life. Now, of course, they used to believe uh, that this was the reason for polygamy early in, in early, in, you know, in the church's years. But um, uh, now, um, uh, they still believe polygamy is uh, in heaven. I guess. Uh, there is an entire section of scripture still in Mormonism called Doctrine and Covenants 132. It's the 132nd section of the Doctrine and Covenants. I think Mike has it open right now. And yes, Mormons believe that polygamy is an eternal principle, which many, there are a number of cults that this is, again, one of their teachings. So, yeah, well, I know a, this is this is the one that's gotten them in trouble with the government as of late. <laughs> right. Well, Abraham Lincoln hated the Mormons practicing polygamy. Mormons then were in the Utah Territory when he was president of the United States in the 1860s. Civil War broke out, but Lincoln was trying to come after the Mormons for practicing polygamy. He was a strong Christian, and he got passed through the Congress the anti-bigamy law so that it was against the law to be polygamous. And uh, Romney, Mitt Romney's family was polygamous. His great-grandfather had to leave Utah and run to Mexico. A lot of the polygamists did that. They ran either to Canada or Mexico. Um, and then, of course, Mitt's family came back during his grandfather's generation, I think. Yeah. Actually, uh, Mitt's uh, uh, father was actually born in a polygamous compound in Mexico City, so not that many generations uh, removed. Uh, uh, so let's let's get back to this uh, polygamy concept, because this is where a lot of the news and the Mormons will say, you know, uh, we who talk about polygamy are anti-Mormon and we don't know what the church teaches and everything else. Okay, I'm looking at the website um, where it talks about, uh, uh, from the LDS Church, this is official uh, website, it says, do Latter-day Saints practice polygamy? It says, no, there are more than 14 million members of the church, and, and again, none of them is a polygamist, okay? Mm-hmm. So what that means is that they do not practice physical polygamy, okay? In other words, mm-hmm. because it's against federal law, they're smart enough to know if they, if they do practice it, they're going to be put in jail, so they're not going to do it, and, and they believe one of the articles of faith. They believe in following the, the laws and ordinances or the laws uh, of the land. The, the fact is, though, they do believe, as Lynn mentioned earlier, that it will be practiced in the hereafter. Okay, Joseph Smith is sealed to at least 33 women, um, and actually he was sealed to hundreds of women. And when I say sealed, that means to be married in the hereafter. Uh, right, uh, right, in the hereafter for all time and eternity. And actually, after Joseph Smith died, there were hundreds of women who were sealed to him because they wanted to be his wife in the hereafter, uh, which is crazy. Brigham Young was sealed to like 54 women. So the in his concept, lifetime. In his lifetime. Yeah. So the concept of polygamy, uh, it was removed because Utah wanted to become a state, and the fact is the federal government came in and around 1890 and said, look, unless you stop practicing polygamy, we're going to take over your temples. And lo and behold, a revelation came that says we don't need to practice polygamy anymore, uh, just like that, because the uh, the government was going to seize the uh, LDS property, and, and the, the, the Mormon church didn't want that. But the fact is that after we were members, okay, for for many many years, the concept came up, you know, in priesthood. It would talk about yes, it is an eternal principle. Yes, it will be practiced in the millennium when Christ comes back and rules the earth for a thousand years. It will be legal again to practice polygamy. Um, 
and th- and and this is how how condescending the LDS church leaders are. The LDS church has a prophet who speaks as an oracle for God, is the only person authorized to speak for God on this earth. And he has two counselors, and then they have 12 apostles. And these apostles, these 12 apostles in the Mormon church carry the same weight and status as the original 12. In fact, even more weight because they are the living apostles, and their words supersede the apostles of old. And any dead right. scripture. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, this whole concept of polygamy, there are three apostles, okay? And this is sad that their first wife have, has died, okay? Huh. They're current, cur- current apostles. These are current apostles. These are men living around, walking around the United States now. Okay, right. their first wife died. Okay, but because they believe in eternal principle of polygamy, when they married again, they went to the Mormon temple and they married that person, and they were sealed to them for all time and eternity. Okay, so for example, uh, Elder Oaks who uh, used to be an attorney, was a, a judge and everything, he is now, he's a Mormon apostle, he is sealed to two women, okay? His first wife is dead, now he's sealed to his second wife on this earth, okay? And when they all die, they will all be united in heaven as husband and wives. That is a right. Mormon, pure Mormon doctrine, and they can't deny that, or they wouldn't be practicing that. And so, now, now what, what happens so, to polygamy if you've only been married to one wife? Is, is it possible, I, I, from what you've said, um, Joseph Smith has been sealed to many, many women that after he had died. That means women actually, were they having like fictional weddings to the dead Joseph Smith in the Mormon church, these women? Yes, someone stood in proxy. Yes. For him in the temple, mm-hmm. yes, that can be done. Um, wow! But he was married to thirty-three live women while, right. he, and eleven of those were married to other men at the same time, and one was as young as fourteen. Yeah, there were there were his other elders. They, they, he took their wives from them. He but, did, and then sent them on missions, yeah. and then messed with their wives. Yes, you know. But but the fact is, the LDS does not practice polygamy today physically but spiritually right. they practice it they believe in it it's an eternal principle and it will be practiced in the hereafter and and therefore um uh, you know my sister i converted my my dear sister to mormonism and she's still very active today she is divorced uh and she never did marry a mormon man it was she married somebody else who, before she joined the the, uh, the lds church and they got a divorce. And she tells me, she says, thank goodness we're going to have polygamy in the hereafter because I will, once I'm dead, I will be sealed to another man, to another righteous man. And if he has other wives, so be it. At least I will have a wife. Okay? And, and that is, I mean, I mean that, that they'll have, she'll have a husband. That she'll be married. And that is a concept that is taught. So many, many women in the LDS Church who do not ever get married in this life mm-hmm. know that they will be sealed to somebody in the hereafter because that is the eternal principle and will go on through the millennium. Well, and it's not just that you want to be married. Your your salvation is determined by marriage. You need to be married to a man. If you're a woman, you need to be married to a man in order to get to the highest rung of heaven. Mormons believe in three different rungs of heaven, and the top one, the celestial kingdom, has three different rungs, and you want to get to the top. And the only way you can get to the top is to be married to a man sealed in the temple for time and all eternity. Let, so then what yeah. happens to the single women? Because uh, they're not mar- if you die a single woman uh, they, here on earth and you never get married, um, okay. don't you have to this, be... This way it will work. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, let's say a, a, a single a lady dies, okay? Then sometime either... Currently, or they say this will happen in the millennium, 
okay, mm. is that uh, somebody will stand in the temple proxy for both of them, okay, uh, and and there will be a man that stands there, and he may be representing somebody who's already married to ten women, and then there will be another lady there in proxy for the the lady that's dead, and she will be still to this man, and then by the priesthood power. Uh, the, uh, they will seal them together, and what's bound on earth will be bound in heaven. That's what they use that expression. That's why it has to be done on this earth and this temple uh, on the earth. And by doing that ordinance on this earth, it will make it uh, a, a, an eternal principle. So, so all these things that people will be doing, that's why you have all these people doing <laughs> baptisms for the dead, to, to yeah. save these people on this, on this earth and then to be able to seal them as families, to, and, and so forth, but uh, the the fact is is that um, there are the, the church always taught that there are more righteous women than men, and therefore in the eternities, to, so women can progress to godhood. Also, she has to be married to a man. Now, I'm going to read something to you from current Mormon scriptures. Women don't actually get to godhood; they just get to be queens to the men who are in godhood. Well, you know, they, get, they, get the wonderful, okay. so. they get the wonderful privilege of being pregnant forever. That's, that's right. Whatever, that's, that's, e- that's what eternal every woman pregnancy. really wants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, since, since we're talking about this, let's go to the Mormon scriptures so people out there uh-huh. will not think I'm nuts. Okay. Right. So I'm, I'm looking in current Mormon scriptures, Doctrine and Covenants 132, verse 37. Now, in Christianity, we were always taught that Abraham was counted righteous because of his faith. Is that correct? Right. Right. Okay. Hebrews 11. Right, right. So now, this is what the Mormon scriptures say. Abraham received concubines, and they bore him children, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. They were given unto him... And he abode in my law, that's the law of polygamy, as Isaac mm-hmm. also and Jacob did, and none other things than that which they were commanded, and because they did none other things than that which were commanded, they have entered into their exaltation, the celestial kingdom, the highest degree of glory, according to the promise to sit upon thrones and are not angels, but are gods. Okay? That's how you get to be a That's god. That's how you become a god. You have to practice polygamy. Okay? Now, and so, let, me propose, let me propose an example. Uh, so you're like your sister, 55, okay? I'm just I'm using her age. As, and um, is there like a certain age where women in Mormonism start panicking and they say, okay, when I hit 55, I definitely have to have a marriage by proxy. Or, um, and you know, because they feel like, okay, I'm not going to, I'm probably not going to find a mate on this yeah. planet at this age. Yeah, they don't have to do the proxy themselves. Someone else can do the marriage after they're dead. So what they're hyper about is making sure that someone does it once they're dead oh. for them. Yeah, you can't, so you I can't guess, do it while you're so, alive. So some man has to has to man up and say, you know, I'm going to marry this woman who had passed away at such and such a date. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Well, or someone or someone chooses a name of someone else who's dead and just seals them together. And then the idea is, oh, they're dead, they're on the other side, they can choose to accept it or reject it. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah probably the way this would work. Uh, we'll have to go to the Mormonism manual of marriage here, <laughs> is that the, um, uh, let's say, you know, heaven forbid, but let's say my sister or some, some lady dies who's not married. She will then go to the spirit world because she's a righteous. She will go to the right side of the spirit wa- world waiting for her mm-hmm. resurrection. And there she'll meet other men's spirits who are righteous also. And they will say, you know, we are spirit brothers and sisters, so um, I, I think you should be married to me. So sometime in the future, I don't know when and how it's going to be done, but sometime during the millennium, there will be word given back to the earth, 
which obviously this will be, can work because Christ will be ruling the earth at this point. So they'll text back a message to somebody here on the earth, and they'll say, can you go to the temple as proxies and marry this lady and this man together for all time and eternity? That's theoretically the way it's going to work. Okay. So they get on their, they get on their celestial blackberries and start texting. That's that's right. That's right. I, you know, I mean, I, I'm not trying to make fun of it, but that is the concept of what we actually believe. And right. that, in other words, we would say we don't know how God's going to do it, but we know it will be done and will be completed in, in by by the millennium. That's part of the thousand year reign. That. That's what's going to be done is all this temple work going on, saving all these people and marrying all these people who had died before. So, now, so it's, uh, I, it's, it's, I want to, it's I want to get back into, I want to get back into your story. Okay. That you guys, okay. You guys became Mormons and you have how many, how many children you have two boys and, and, and uh, is it just the two boys or do you have other children? We have three sons and a daughter and three sons uh, and a daughter. I know you said two of our boys are in the band. Actually, our daughter married another member of the band, so two sons and a son-in-law God has placed in ministry in our Okay, that's great. That's wonderful. Yeah. So, okay, so then you have your daughter and you have your other then you have your other son who's not in the band, right? Right. Although they all served missions, all three of the boys served missions, two-year okay. missions. And how long how long were you guys in the LDS church? Thirty years. <laughs> 30 years. That, that's a long time. The uh, yeah, and and we were not what they call Jack Mormons. We actually believed it. We actually did it. Right. We actually did not watch TV on Sundays. We we did the whole thing. We held temple recommends from the time we could get our temple recommend, and uh, we worked it, in the temple. Yeah, it's uh, 1979. Well, now, we got what, our temple what are recommend. the positions? What are the positions in the Mormon Church? You start out, and you you, you join. Was it you become a priest in the order of Melchizedek, right? And so what, is it, there are yeah, th- 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 this is the way it works. Um, um, if, if if you're a child growing up in the church, uh, you're basically commanded to get baptized at eight. That's standard age of accountability. Because Mormons believe you're not born into sin, and you can't sin until the age of eight. But then wow. when you hit eight, you better get baptized. Yeah, it's time to get baptized. And then uh, they go through a program. Well, my boy is doing something at four, though. <laughs> <laughs> they, don't, they don't know Ethan. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed this with my grandsons. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's amazing how children who are six cannot sin. That's amazing. So, <laughs> but uh, what, what the LDS Church would officially teach would say they're not held accountable for their sins. Yeah. So you know, that's in other words, if you were talking to some church apologist, they would say, "Oh no, no, we're crazy." The children are not held accountable uh, until at the age of eight. Then you're held accountable. So the kids will sin, but they're just not. It's just not recorded How do get by eight? the angels. How do they get that number eight? I, I don't know. It's it's just a number they came up with uh, by revelation uh, through Joseph Smith or somebody said you know eight was you know around eight. It doesn't have to be exactly. I mean, if you wait till nine, you, you, you're really getting a lot of pressure. But even Okay. Even I remember our, we, our children on their birthdays. Usually, usually their birthdays. near their birthday, on their birthday, when they turn age, you get baptized. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So, so once uh, let's say you have a son. I had three sons. Uh, so they go through primary, which is a children's organization. But when the son turns twelve, okay, he's ready to receive the um, Aaronic priesthood. Okay, hmm. uh, and he becomes a deacon. Okay. okay, so wow. Uh, wow. you have in, in, in by twelve in the Mormon Church you have deacons. Okay? okay, which is not exactly the same deacon as defined in the Bible because I don't know too many twelve-year-olds married. <laughs> so, right. okay, then when they become fourteen, they become what they call teachers. Again, all under the Aaronic priesthood, the priesthood of Aaron. Mm-hmm. Okay, again, even though they may not have the bloodline. They're, they're given this priesthood, okay? Then by the time they turn 16, they become priests, okay? Um, then when they become around 19 uh, and they're preparing to go on their mission, 
then they receive uh, their Melchizedek priesthood. Uh, okay. And then they get their temple endowment and the, at the age of 19, as around that, and then they go on from there. Now, for myself, since I was an adult when I was baptized, uh, after I was baptized, I had men uh, lay their hands on my head and set me apart to receive the Aaronic priesthood. Okay? Mm-hmm. So I received that. Now, uh, since I was newly baptized, I had to prove myself worthy. Now, I, I don't go through the, the classes of the deacon, uh, teacher, priest. I just receive the, the Aaronic priesthood. Okay? Um, then, because I'm an adult, uh, then I work for basically a year in the church, attending my meetings, doing my responsibilities, attending sacrament meetings, proving myself worthy, okay, and usually within a, about a year, a new new uh, baptized man will receive the Melchizedek priesthood, okay, and once I receive the Melchizedek priesthood, then I can start preparing to take my family to the temple, or my wife at that point, uh, so uh, everything's done according, all these priesthood offices are given to you according to your righteousness and your works. Then by the time of uh, I was around 36, then I was given the office of a high priest. Okay, uh, So I, I held the office of, of Melchizedek priesthood, but in that office I was a high priest. And that's basically, then, then once you go from there, you become a bishop, you become an apostle, and you become prophet. Okay. Now, uh, so, the high priest, is that the highest position at the local church, or is that is, uh, the bishop's high yeah, yeah. For example, even and even the regional. Yeah, he, even the prophet of the Mormon Church, he he's a high priest. Okay, so uh, which is interesting. There are thousands of high priests in the Mormon Church, but in the biblical times, how many high priests did we have? Uh, one. One. <laughs> so uh, it, it's it's a it, but it's that same concept of where they take the name of something and then they change it totally. To fit their particular needs, mm-hmm. so uh, but uh, but uh, in the local congregation, the highest person who controls is the bishop, okay, which is a high priest. And I was a counselor to two bishops uh, over a period of years, one in Indiana and one in Utah. Again, wonderful men, you know, great experiences. You, you, I mean, the people are wonderful. They just are locked up in incorrect doctrine. Then in, uh, you have the bishop at the ward level. Then above him, that picks him, is called a state president. And that's in a local regional area that controls about 11, uh, 12 organizations, wards or chapels or uh, churches, Congregation. congregations. So, uh, and again, he's a high priest also. So once you get up to leadership positions in the Mormon church, uh, bishopric, um, high priest group leader, um, mm. Those you have to have the office of high priest um, right. to to serve. That's so what that's so boring. You, you you were right up in line to become a bishop. Um, yeah, actually, I served in a position in a way that could be even defined a little bit higher than that. I was I served on a state high council. I actually traveled to different ward congregations and spoke, and I kind of would oversee and teach bishops. So it's, oh, okay. it's this different different uh, uh, situations, but uh, a bishop has a unique responsibility over that congregation. Uh, but I had a responsibility over training people in, in, in the wards and and in, in the stake. So, uh, but uh, a bishop is a bishop by definition uh, is is a very very important calling. And probably if I stayed active in the LDS Church, I would have you know probably being called as a bishop because of this, the training. Uh, but right. who knows? It's, it's up to God uh, in Mormonism. Every, every calling, every job given to you is by inspiration. So when they come and talk to you and say, Brother Wilder or Sister Wilder, you want to serve in this position, it's always being called as God is asking you to do that. So you basically do not turn down a calling because you're turning down God. That's the mindset right. of people. So um, now, um, now, now, Lynn, Lynn, uh, you served as a professor at BYU. Did you get your education there also? 
No, in fact, in order to teach at Brigham Young University, Brigham Young is owned by the Mormon Church. It's one of the largest private universities in the United States. It has about 34,000 students. Um, When I was interviewed, you have to be interviewed by a church general authority, and then you have to maintain righteousness in order to keep your job at BYU. So when I was interviewed, he said to me, I've been interviewing faculty for BYU for years, and I've never come upon somebody like you. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh, what what makes me different? And he said, you've never lived in Utah. You were not schooled at BYU, and and you're a convert to the church. So I walked into an environment where literally all my colleagues were generational Mormons, had recognizable names from polygamy. You know, when those guys were polygamous, all of a sudden they had 150 kids, and so now their descendants in Utah, the name Young is everywhere. You know, I had Mm. three Youngs out of ten faculty in my department. Or the name Call, or, you know, there are some real distinctly Mormon names that just kind of recirculate through leadership. Um, That's a little bit scary because uh, you you, you might be getting married to family and, (laughs) you know, (laughs) over there. (laughs) That's quite that's quite possible. Um, I'm sure people's genealogy come back together at some point. So Brigham Young really was full of generational folks um, who knew Mormon culture, knew who was important, knew how to be respectful to the right people. And I was a little bit out of the culture at first. It seemed really weird. And I didn't realize until I got there that being a convert to the church makes you a second-class citizen. Because remember all those spirits, I said, were waiting in the spirit world to come to a body. Well, there are kind of rules for which family you get to come to. Um, if you're a real wishy-washy spirit and you're not sure that you really want to follow Jesus Christ, you end up in a black home. Imagine this, this teaching. And then if you were a really valiant spirit in the pre-existence and you really loved Heavenly Father, you would come to a Mormon family. Well, every spirit wants to come to a Mormon family, so they that's why they teach you to have ten kids so that all those spirits can come to Mormon families instead of ending up somewhere horrendous, you know, with somebody who doesn't know the real doctrine um, that's true, according to them. So I was a second-class citizen because in the pre-existence, I wasn't righteous enough to be born into a Mormon family. I was born into a Christian family and then converted. Right. So wow, you was, almost as bad. You was almost as bad as Lamanite. <laughs> almost as bad as a Lamanite. You're right. Yeah. Yes. Wow. That's a, that's a little Mormon joke for those of you. <laughs> the Lamanites were a a tribe, a, a, a rebel tribe in the Book of Mormon. So. Uh, Supposedly, and by the way, they were all black too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had they were given dark skin as a curse because they were evil. But that yeah. that doctrine changed this year though. <laughs> it, lo and behold, that is not the doctrine. Um it's it's amazing uh, since Romney's been running for president how many of the church doctrines have changed. It's just like right. no, we we don't teach that. No, that Satan and Jesus are brothers. Well, that, uh, I don't think we teach such a thing. You know, it's it's uh, it's 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 amazing what they're doing trying to cover their tracks on on things. But the, Lynn's got but a couple of things. Just like polygamy, what you have is you still have racial statements all over LDS scripture. I mean, even though they'll say to the public we don't believe that, it's right there in their scriptures. You know, all this stuff about being exceedingly fair and white, uh, having a sore cursing as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome that they might not be enticed 
to marry unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. Ironically, the the, the witnesses, Charles Hayes Russell, had a similar theology. Um, I just want our listeners to know, because uh, um, we're hitting at the 25-minute mark, that's uh, 25 minutes left into the show, we're going to have Mike and Lynn on next week also. And um, so that whatever we don't cover within uh, this program, we'll cover in the next program, and, and we're going to definitely talk a little politics. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, no, no. Next... <laughs> We're going to talk a little politics on the next program, but but if you have questions, just press one. Uh, if you're listening to the program on three four seven nine three four zero three seven nine, press one because uh, I, I want to get some listeners on. And I see we have a listener five zero nine who wants to ask or share something with you guys. Listener five zero nine. Yes, Mike and Lynn. So glad you were on today in the program. Really great. I've done a lot of research into Latter-day Saints for many years, even been down in the Utah many times. I'm wondering, did you ever know that Joseph Smith got some of his ideas from patristic writers, like Oregon, for example? Uh, say again that, that he got some of his ideas from where? Patristic writers, early church fathers like Origen, O R I G I N Origen. Oh, who knows? I I really don't know what the, where Joseph Smith. I do know that there are a lot of philosophies that he came up with the Book of Mormon from a previous uh, 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 pastor that wrote a fiction called The View of the Hebrews. Uh, so he 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 was a very intelligent person. And uh, he knew how to tell stories and could, you know, uh, get people very excited about things. He was very charismatic in, in, in the way he taught. So uh, I do not specifically can say that, yes, he got this here and here. The only thing I know of that there was the Book of the Hebrews that was published about five or six years before the Book of Mormon. The that view, was the view of the Hebrews. View, view of the Hebrews, right. Right. Uh, no, I've heard of that. But actually, one of his, what, the three witnesses – was a uh, minister? Yes. Was, uh, right, and I I believe that he got these ideas from that minister who knew the patristics. Joseph Smith not have, might not have known the patristics originally. Yeah, that could have been Sidney Rigdon, who was a very, right. very intelligent person also, who who had a major influence on the doctrine of what Joseph Smith taught. He kind of introduced the priesthood uh, the, the, that we were talking about earlier, the Aaronic priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood. Because, see, the LDS Church was organized in 1830, and there was actually no mention of the priesthood at that point. There's no mention of the priesthood in the Book of Mormon. But outside, now, it, it's priesthood, everything, everything controlled by the priesthood, and Sidney Rigdon introduced that concept. Yeah, Mormonism really um, started out very Christian. They actually believed in the Trinity. You know, it had many similarities, and as the years went on, Joseph Smith began to write his own version of the Bible and kind of spin his own doctrine. Right. No, it's very interesting. They have a very unique and interesting history, especially the Mountain Meadows Massacre. You're yes. probably familiar with that. Yes. Did, yeah. did you did you realize that the Mormon Church, about seven years ago, officially stated that they were responsible for that, the leaders of the Mormon Church were responsible for that, and they apologized for it? Were yes, you aware they- of that? They pretty much had to because the movie September Dawn came out and made it pretty public that uh, the Mormons had been involved in killing pioneers that they called Gentiles. Mormons believe that they are the real Jews and the rest of the outside world is Gentiles, and these were Gentiles coming through their property. Besides, they were Gentiles from Missouri that they thought might have had something to do with... um, the Not death of one of their apostles mm-hmm. there in yes. Missouri. Yeah. Yes, yes, a man who had come there as an apostle and took a wife from a man, and they were very yeah. upset about that. So they <laughs> yeah. were going to, you know, redo, want to apologize, make him apologize for that. It's a great, great history. There's a book written that I have 
when, when I got down there from the first wife, I mean a wife of Brigham Young, who was the first, his daughter here, her father was the first editor of the Salt Lake City newspaper at that time. And I even forget his name right now. Maybe you know. It's fascinating. It's interesting, isn't it? But it's it's uh, none of it's true. <laughs> I'm I'm not I'm not saying that all the Mormon doctrines are in the in the patristics, but some of them, some of the very important ones, came from the uh, writer Origen, who was quite a famous writer back at that time, and that's where that pre-human existence thing came in to the yeah. Mormon church from his writings. But there's others, too. If you get a chance, read Origen in a position. You'll thoroughly enjoy it. You really will. Really great sound. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. We'll, we thank will take you. your advice on that. Thank you Very so much. much. Mm. Bye-bye. <laughs> in fact, um, I think Richard um, might be on to something there because um, we actually were had an Eastern Orthodox friend on uh, last week, and I think that the Mormon uh, statement that uh, as God is, man shall become. Or, yes, as, yes. As man is, uh, as God, man once, is God was, once was, as God is, man may man be. Shall. Yeah, man may be. I think that is actually a quote from uh, one of the patristics last week. And so I think that um, Joseph Smith may have gotten uh, some of his pieces from the patristics, or at least a misunderstanding of what the uh, the early um, church taught on, on those matters. But um, so I, I do think that um, Richard might be onto something there. And uh, and, and it's, it's very common for um, the cults to um, read um, the writings of the early church or the Bible and misunderstand it and then reinvent it in their own context. And so yeah, I, I, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm Joseph, very... Joseph. Joseph Smith was very good at reinventing things because, uh, uh, you know, he would take a concept and just run with it. But as Lynn mentioned earlier, when when the Book of Mormon was originally written, there are many, many, many verses that are plagiarized directly out of the Bible. So if wow. a person's reading certain sections of the Book of Mormon, they're basically reading the King James Version of the Bible. So if they feel good about that, that's because they're yeah. actually reading the Word of God. And and but over a period of time, Joseph you know even changed the Book of Mormon, the doctrine of the Book of Mormon, because when it was written, it was written as a triune God. But by uh, 1838, that whole concept changed to where we had three individual gods. And and again, you know, doctrine just changed totally different that period of time after that period of time and so forth. Uh, but, but they say that's because of modern revelation. We're given more knowledge and understanding, and therefore can teach new concepts. Yeah, I actually have a, uh, uh, I guess it's a reprint of the original copy of the Book of Mormon. I got it through Utah Lighthouse Ministry. Yes. I don't know if you yeah, know Sandra. Yes. Good friend. Yeah, and um, it's, uh, it was, it's written uh, written by Wood, Woodruff, or Woodruff Wilson. Um but it has no numbers on it, and uh, Wilfred Woodruff. Yeah, yes, yes, that's the author, third yeah. prophet. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and it's, it's in a nice little camel hardback cover, but um, and it has some pictures of um, actually the sites of Palmyra and and some of the other locations that um, Mormons, the Mormon Church, uh, assumes were the, those locations. Right. But um, yeah. So uh, you know. Uh, it's definitely uh, interesting to to see how uh, you know. I guess that's how Joseph Smith evolved through the years in his doctrine, and uh, and I think the witnesses, uh, like I said, this is almost like an exact parallel. In fact, the history of the Mormon Church is almost an exact parallel to the Jehovah's Witnesses, and I, and I think I spoke with Lynn about this before, and that and that their histories. Um, that is the LDS Church that is actually a break off from Joseph Smith Jr.'s church, which is now at Missouri, um, and uh, the, you know the dispute between I guess who would we follow, Brigham Young and Joseph Smith, and Missouri mm-hmm. being the actual place where Mormons look to for you know the restore restoration of Jerusalem, I guess. Yes, and, and for Christ uh, to return. 
Yeah, and then but the LDS Church, led under Brigham Young, outgrew, of course, um, uh, that church, which is, I think, the reorganized LDS Church, but they go by another name nowadays. Yeah, Community of Christ, right, I yeah. think. Yeah, mm-hmm. right, right. And so um, um, uh, for the Jehovah's Witnesses, Charles T. Russell, who was the original founder, um, when he died, um, uh uh, he had willed his corporation to uh, seven directors, and three who continued to follow his teachings um, uh, had, the, I guess, the, the corporation taken from them by Judge Rutherford, uh, who was not assigned to take over the organization, but he was a lot more legal-minded and was smarter about getting the proprietary rights. And so um, under Judge Rutherford, like Brigham Young, that organization outgrew the original founders um mm. uh, organization under its proper lineage um and, and i i I'm, i still don't understand why um Joseph Smith jr didn't in, you know get more of a, a following uh, than uh, brigham young but i guess we can discuss that next week on on, on another program but um and we have just 14 minutes but I, I definitely want to get into your story about how you guys, um, what what was the, the, the first glimmers, the first things that you started to see that, mm-hmm, that doesn't quite make sense or that just doesn't sound, you know, right. What, what were the first things that both of you um, uh, encountered that just made you question the LDS church? Well, First, I would say this about being in a cult. Um, The Bible says there is a spirit of blindness that now when I look back, it was very real. There were things that were in front of my face that I simply ignored or the spirit of blindness did not allow me to see until I surrendered my life to Jesus. Jesus took the blinders off. I could see. I could hear. Um, But while we were in Mormonism, certainly polygamy was one of those things that we went, that's the stupidest thing we've ever heard of. Like, we don't want to live that. Like, You know, and I was a Relief Society president, which there's a bishop over a a ward, and then there's a Relief Society president who's over all the adult women in the ward. And so she works side by side with the bishop. I was a Relief Society president, and we used to teach lessons on polygamy, and the women hated it. You know, they turned up their noses like, I want to live that. Oh, that makes me sick. You know, and in the end... You always say, but in the next life, we're going to understand things better and then we'll be able to accept it. You know, there's always this blind faith thing in the end in the Mormon church. So, I mean, should that not have been a sign? That was certainly should have been a sign. Plus, in the 80s, I read a book about um, Joseph Smith's wife and how much um, Joseph hid the polygamy from her, lied to her, then when he finally tells her she didn't she doesn't want to live it, how angry she was, how he'd bring pregnant women into the house, how one time she threw one down a stairs and she miscarried, you know, I knew those stories and yet wow. how can you be so blind for that not to affect you? The second thing then that God hit me over the head with was racism. I taught multiculturalism at BYU, and my very first semester there, my students started teaching me about the curse of Cain. I had never heard of the curse of Cain before. I didn't know anything about it, but I soon learned it was in Mormon scripture. I found where it was, and these folks were generational Mormons. They knew all about it, and so um, that began part of my journey out and god had prepared me to be really um sick to hear that message because i went to high school during the civil rights movement 
I listened to the black preachers on the corners. My high school was shut down for race riots. I was on the side of my black friends. <laughs> then I then I ended up teaching multiculturalism. So racism should have been something that took me out of the Mormon church like that. But, again, it took a few years for that to ruminate. Um, that spirit of blindness is very, very real. And I had to come to a place where I wanted to know the truth and where I surrendered everything to the Christ, to the Bible. And then he opened my eyes. Now I'm I'm curious. Um, uh, were you uh, guys both Mormons prior to the 1978 revelation of uh, I think of Prophet Kimball? <laughs> yeah, about ten months before we joined the church, and we found out the blacks couldn't hold the Mormon priesthood just a couple days before we got baptized. Of course, the missionaries weren't going to tell us that, but I think <laughs> somebody told you at work or something, right? Right, right. Uh, it, it's interesting. Again, as as normal with the missionaries, they tell you just what they want you to know, and right. not everything. And uh, we we were scheduled. I think I found this out. Like um, I was teaching at the university, and somebody told me that you know blacks can't hold the priesthood, and that was like on a Wednesday. And we we're getting baptized on a Friday night, and we didn't have the internet back then, and I didn't have any way to research it real quickly and the missionary said oh you know it, it was just it was just given for a short period of time and then taken away and and you know it, it's, we don't understand about everything about god and so forth so they just kind of made up a nice excuse uh talking about remember how jesus came and talked to the jews first before he talked to the gentiles that's the same thing here we're you know the, the blacks will eventually get the priesthood someday but uh you know and so it was just a roundabout way we were so indoctrinated at that point we just said yeah we'll go ahead and research it afterwards and then lo and behold revelation came 10 months later that uh and, and we actually cried we we said oh isn't this wonderful god is working in this church well you know should mm -hmm. realize that they should never have been a restriction of the priesthood to begin with due to our poor right. knowledge of the bible i mean uh, you know, Paul states in, in Galatians, you know, there's neither bond or free or Gentile or Jew or male or female, but we're all free in Christ. And and, and it's interesting you brought this concept up because uh, a few months ago uh, somebody was asking, uh, and maybe we should carry this on to next week, but they uh, was asking a BYU professor about racism in the church. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, he got in all kinds of trouble because he taught what was actually taught in the LDS church. I mean, everything mm -hmm. that was taught to Lynn, everything that was taught to us about racism, this professor taught. It says here, this is from the church website, um, it states here that the position uh, attributed, uh, the, the positions attributed to BYU professor Randy Bolt in a recent Bolt. Washington Post, Bolt, excuse mm -hmm. me, uh, in a recent Washington Post article, absolutely do not represent the teachings and doctrines of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is interesting because that is what was openly taught for 30 years to us. Well, and he's sudden, a religion he professor. He teaches his stuff every day. He knows it's the truth. That is what the scriptures say. That w That is what they teach. The Mormon Church doesn't want him telling it to the outside world. What the church wrong. really believes. Yeah. It says that BYU faculty members do not speak for the church. Isn't that interesting? And then other times they do speak for the church. Uh, so Well, the church owns BYU. Church tithing pays for BYU. And um, the church certainly sent me all over the world to schmooze for the church and try to open doors for the missionaries. Um, interesting. Yeah. And then, then they go ahead and go on to say here, and this this is just, to me, I, I just almost want to laugh. Really, I really want to cry at this because it says here, for a time in the church, in the Mormon church, there was a restriction on the priesthood for male members of African descent. Then it goes on and says, it says, it is not known precisely why, how, or when this restriction began in the church, but what is clear is that it ended decades ago. Well, we know exactly why, because those spirits that came from the preexistence weren't righteous spirits. This is what was taught to us, and they were born in black families, and black families were not righteous enough to hold the priesthood. It, it, it's, 
it's just amazing what the church would put on their website to cover. Well, this professor was teaching that concept, what we were taught, and he gets in all kinds of trouble. And I think he may even have to take early retirement now. Who knows? <laughs> so. Well, I, I, I could I could share with you guys an experience I had with some Mormon elders because I, I love to pick on the racism uh, of the LDS church when I have Mormon missionaries coming at my door <laughs> as a man of color myself. And so, um, and and I love to watch them cringe. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is no justification. What can you say? And and no, after but, I but got I, to yeah, go ahead. You you love it the way I play it though. I, I play it. You know, I was like, aren't you the Church of Joseph Smith? Uh, you, this is, I mean, Joseph Smith is the founder of this church, right? And they and and they'll say yes. I said, well, why, how come you don't believe what Joseph Smith taught? And they'll say. Uh, what do you mean we don't believe what Joseph Smith taught? Joseph Smith taught that that if we are black in, in skin, we were cursed of God, and that the only way the Lamanites showed true repentance and God's uh, revelation of their righteousness was that their skin would turn back to being white. Yes. And so and- how can you allow me into the priesthood as long as my skin is still the color of black? Apparently, I have not become pure enough. I have to become white in order to be a part of the priesthood, just like any Lamanite would, you know, in in in, in the Book of Mormon. Well, it's actually in the Pearl of Great Price, I think. Um, and uh, I said, why are you listening to Prophet Kimball when Prophet Smith, the founder of your church, teaches something completely different from Prophet Kimball? <laughs> and, so, you know, I'm actually... Defending Joseph Smith, I was like, I would respect you more if you actually followed the founder of your church, but you don't. <laughs> so I can't join a church who only nominally follows their founder. <laughs> Excellent. Brigham Young was even more of a racist than Joseph Smith. Brigham Young stood in front of the Utah Territorial Legislature in 1852 and convinced them to become a slave territory. Utah was the only slave territory in the United States um, with the South. Um, Learned all of this at BYU once I started going researching. (laughs) And praise God, he took us to the heart of Mormon territory to learn these things. Otherwise, I don't know. Now, um, do you guys know a, a good friend of mine? He's the one who's, who's been helping me out so much with getting LDS people. Do you know Keith Walker? Yes, I do, from Texas. Yeah, Keith, yeah, Keith is an amazing Christian. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, that that's how uh, I got in contact with you all and, and and some other people that he's gotten me in contact with. So, yeah, so shout-out to Keith Walker. Uh, thank you so much uh, for blessing me. Um we're at the last two minutes of the program. I just want to thank you guys for coming on today and look forward to picking this up next week for our listeners. Um, so uh, uh, we just want to ask our listeners to, to pray for Mormons, pray for the Mormon missionaries. Don't uh, send them away. If you have nothing to share, if, if you're not really sharp on your faith, then, you know, offer them something to drink at the door. Show them some Christian kindness yeah. and pray for them. Pray for Jehovah's Witnesses. Pray for ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. Pray for Mormons and pray for those that have left the Mormon church that still need, uh, that are still lost. Um, the, the name of the program is Healing XJWS. That is that we are ex-Witnesses that are still in the process of healing. And so uh, I would I would imagine that there are many ex Mormons that are in the process of healing. Uh, being in a cult can anger you; it can burn you bad. And so we hope that these these programs and this program will help help somebody out there to heal a little bit, uh, to find Christ, to find peace in their life and joy. Uh, and uh, so that's the purpose of these programs. So. Uh, Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Lynn, for coming on today. We're looking forward to having you guys on next week, and we'll finish your story and talk a little bit more about Mormon theology and a little bit about Mitt Romney, which I'm sure everybody is, is curious to know. Uh, what do you feel about uh, it? We'll answer this question. This this will be the question we'll answer next week. Uh, what does Mike and Lynn Wilder feel about 
why we should or shouldn't have a Mormon president or what are the repercussions possibly mm-hmm. of having a Mormon president here in the United States. So uh, those of you who are listening, uh, you can listen to this on podcasts at www.blogtalkradio.com backslash HealingXJWS. Join the conversation on our blog site at HealingXJWS.com and look forward to uh, seeing you next week, 9 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time on Healing XJWS Radio. See you next week and pray for Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. Bye-bye.